Welcome, everyone. Um, just to get an idea, I think we've got some engineers and maybe some architects in here as well. Have we got the engineers and scientists? Can we have a show of hands? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And someone more from the FBE side of things, Faculty of the Build Environment. Have we got any of those people here? Yeah. Welcome. I thought I spotted a few people, so that's great. Thank you. Good to see you. Well, look, I'm going to talk today about low carbon buildings. Uh, I'm going to basically give you a whistle stop tour on the sorts of things that are of interest to me and also to tell you a little bit about uh, a cooperative research centre which has recently been established uh, that I'm a part of, uh, a low carbon living it's called. It's a multidisciplinary research effort right across Australia. There are five Australian universities plus CSIRO. There's a wide range of industry uh, organisations, government organisations, putting money, time and energy and effort into investigating how can we minimise carbon in the built environment. So uh, today I'm not going to be perhaps terribly coherent, but uh, I'm hoping to at least give you a little bit of a flavour of some of the things that we're going to be working on in the CRC. The CRC got established in July last year. We started off in July 2012. So we're just getting up and running, a lot of paperwork, uh, getting some projects up off the ground. If I haven't put the um, if I haven't put the web page up for you, I apologise for that in my talk. I'll uh, put that up at some stage. Okay. Oh, um, does anyone know where that is? Uh, sorry. Can we dim some lights here, Rob? Are people are people happy to see that? People can see the the slides. Okay, is that all right? Yeah. And can you hear me when I'm away from the microphone? I bet you can. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't I shouldn't bet, but. Um, I'm probably someone who doesn't need that one. And that's a good sign for me to turn off my phone and probably everybody else's as well can do that, but uh, you've probably already done it. So sorry for that. Uh, and if only I knew how to do this, that's better. Okay, um, does anyone recognise that forest? Blue. No? Blue gum, who said that? Yes, thank you. The blue gum forest up in the, uh, the mountains just west of Sydney. Uh, a very interesting little uh, sustainability story there. Uh, in the 1920s or 1930s, someone bought that forest before it was a national park. It's a beautiful stand of blue gum trees up in uh, just out of Blackheath. Someone bought it in the 1930s and they were going to cut it all down, float the timber down the river and uh, sell the timber and, and graze cattle or grow cherry trees. And some bushwalkers very famously some of the very, the earliest national park was established on the back of a few people, a few bushwalkers, taking it upon themselves to alert the world to the fact that there was something very precious and it needed saving. A lesson for us all. Okay, so look, I'm going to whistle stop tour through what I believe is something that's a, a big challenge for all of us and for many people doing research in this area and for many companies and governments interested in how do we make low carbon cities? How do we go from where we are now, which are very energy inefficient, high carbon intensity, all of that sort of thing, how do we get to a low carbon city? So here's my recipe for a low carbon city, energy efficiency, some renewable energy, probably need some storage. We're starting to penetrate the grid that much. We need integrated low carbon design for our buildings, new and retrofit. We need a grid to suit above. I won't talk too much about that today and we need some low carbon behaviour. By the way, just to mention, the CRC covers technical kind of people, scientists, engineers, uh, design people, architects, town planners, uh, precincts, those sorts of areas, plus behavioural people in there, because when we deal with carbon, you can have the best gadgets you like, but if the people uh, operate with the doors and windows open on the hottest day of the year, that building that you've just designed to be zero carbon isn't going to perform terribly well. So people's behaviour comes into it. All right, so energy efficiency. Now look, this is a, a slide, I'm not sure how many people have seen this one, but the International Energy Agency and a number of other organisations around the world love to put together scenarios of where we're heading with carbon dioxide emissions. And I quite like this one because I think they get the balance pretty right. There's a few, I've got a few issues with some of the things on this slide, but let's have a look at it. Roughly 2012, where we are today, 
Uh, there's the business as usual, the reference scenario says in gigatons, we're looking at gigatons on the vertical axis. Oh, I've got a pointer, haven't I? We've got gigatons on the vertical axis and time out to here, roughly today out to 2030. A little bit of a dip there, global financial crisis. Um, some uh, economists or entrepreneurs in, in America basically uh, crashed the uh, world's economy into a tree and uh, said sorry and, and then someone paid them a lot of money to keep on doing what they do. But uh, a rough economic analysis of, of the, the GSC, uh, the downturn in economic activity meant a decrease in our CO2, but that didn't last for long. We've turned that around and we're going back up and we're on this line. This is our conventional sort of growth, more CO2, more economic activity off we go. So there's our business as usual case and we should be very afraid of that because that's not good for the long-term future of the planet, as we know. So IEA looked at a, a reference, uh, the reference scenario, but a 450 parts per million of CO2 into the atmosphere and how do we get there by 2030? What's the plan? And you've probably seen these sorts of wedges. I'll just point out here, the big light blue wedge there is end use efficiency. And that'll be a recurring theme and no surprise to anyone who's heard me talk before. End use efficiency is where we can make the biggest and the fastest and most cost effective gains in tackling CO2. You'll notice we could improve things at power plants, existing power plants, but that's a small improvement there. The engineers in power plants are usually pretty good at tightening up on those sorts of things. It's end use efficiency that we need to be concerned about. Now we could argue about the size of the renewables, but I'll point out, you know, it's, it's it's usually fairly cost effective to tackle the energy efficiency. Renewables, of course, will grow. That could get bigger, I believe, as could the energy efficiency. Biofuels might surprise some people. That's only small. But biofuels are tough. It's tough to get a lot of energy out of um, plant matter, animal matter, etc. And nuclear and carbon capture and storage are a small wedge down here. And I, I guess I'd probably argue, why bother with nuclear and carbon capture and storage? But that's probably a discussion for another time. Okay, so if we look, energy efficiency has a lot to do in terms of contributing to CO2 emissions, as does renewables. And I would argue, if we had more time, that that's probably sufficient. Um, have people seen these sorts of curves before? This is from McKinsey. Maybe people have seen this. These are the sorts of things. These are McKinsey is a is a. Uh, it's, it's not a left-wing hippie think tank, um, they're, they're, you know, and, and most of us hippies have lost our hair, or at least pretend hippies like me. I was a bit young to be a hippie, I, but I did have long hair once, I just wanted to point that out. Um, once. Um, so McKinsey's a pretty um, conventional uh, consulting company that does all sorts of analysis and, and something that they've become quite famous at doing is analysing CO2 and where you can get cost effective CO2 or cost ineffective CO2 reductions in various economies, Australia, America, Europe, the world, whatever you want, you can find a McKinsey report to tell you. So here's the, the curves for Australia. What we're looking at here on the vertical axis is how many tonnes Oh, sorry, how many dollars in Australian dollars, dollars per ton of CO2? To get rid of a, a ton of CO2, what does it cost? So, interesting for us to have a look at that. By the way, if it's a negative cost, well, that's a very good thing. That means it's more economic to be getting rid of that carbon than to be doing the business as usual. Business as usual has a cost of zero. Greater costs, positive values, means that it'll cost us to get rid of a ton of CO2. So. This was a, a study done a few years ago. So solar PV is this little chunk in here. And they said, well, that's going to cost you something like $50 a tonne. That cost is probably now down towards the zero or below that line. And we'll talk about that later. But everything else here that's got negative cost and reasonable chunks, oh, by the way, the horizontal axis is um, megatons, millions of tons of CO2. Australia, roughly at the present time, we emit about 600 megatons of CO2 every year and with business as usual scenario out to 2030, this is the 2030 curve, business as usual scenario would expect that to grow 2, 3, 4% per annum. Ideally we would like to stop it from growing. So the way to do it, well, what's the most cost effective thing here? Well everything that's light blue, I'll just point out, is in buildings if you could read that. 
all the light blue stuff, a lot of the good stuff that we can save cost effectively is energy efficiency in buildings. And I'll talk some more about that later. Oh, also motor systems, things driving pumps, fans, those sorts of things, electric motors, again, energy efficiency, and the dark blue, some transport and some conservation tillage that is trying to plough carbon underground. But anyway, this is of course a moving target all the time. So, but the important thing is that energy efficiency is the uh, cheapest and I would argue, given the IEA curve that I showed you before, there's probably bigger chunks of energy efficiency, there's bigger chunks of carbon we could deal with in, um, by tackling energy efficiency. Now, I always show this curve, it's a bit dated, but it's a lovely curve. This is a um, National Framework on Energy Efficiency report from 2003, and it looks at where is their cost-effective energy efficiency reductions at the end use across various sectors. The dark, what we're looking at here is percentage reductions that are cost effective. The dark red uh, bars are those reductions that are cost effective with a four year payback. You pay now, the energy savings on your bills, pay it back in four years. So you put upfront capital, pay it off in four years. The lighter curve, the lighter bars are an average of an eight year payback. So average four year payback, average eight year. And what you'll notice is that in the residential and commercial sectors, and that's probably where we have about 60% of the stationary energy that we consume in the Australian economy is in, captured in our residential and our com commercial buildings. We could probably cost, well, four year payback around about 30% if we average that. We could get rid of 30% of our energy right now with a four year payback. And that's still true. This report's done in 2003. The real question is, why haven't we done it? Invest now, save energy, pay it back in four years' time. Do you know who's unhappy with this? Who's unhappy? Not me as a consumer, not me as if I am in business. Who's unhappy? Um, all the utilities. Anyone from the utilities? I should always check, shouldn't I? <laughs> but seriously, they are. They would like to reduce peak demand because that's costing them. But if we stop using energy, if we use less energy, then the utilities don't have a business model at this present time that allows them to still be in business if we all start using less energy. What about the water utility? Anyone lived in Sydney over the last 10 years or so? A few of us. We had droughts, didn't we? Warragamba Dam got down to essentially mud, didn't it? About 30% capacity. Sydney Water and other water utilities all around Australia were in, a, in real trouble. They were running out of stuff they could supply. They learnt the lesson that they could still have a business and get their customers to save water. We all use probably 30, 40, 50 percent less, uh, less water in, in Australia than we did 10 or 15 years ago. We've learnt from the drought to use less water. And most of the time, the people on the bus that I sit next to, they smell okay. <laughs> Mostly. Just a note for male university students, when you're standing in the bus with your armpit like that, if I'm sitting there and it's a hot day and you haven't had a shower, I may say something. It's usually the boys. Uh, okay, sorry, moving on. Um, so. Here we are, cost effective, energy efficiency reductions, big chunks of energy that we could save residential commercial. Hey, go to an eight year payback, hard to convince commercial building uh, developers that they should invest in things with an eight year payback, by the way. But in an ideal world, ultimately, perhaps we'll convince them that it is a good idea for the future of the planet. That way they have customers in the future too, you see. Uh, it, but anyway, eight year payback, something like 70%, 70% of the energy that we currently use could be cost effectively done away with. And then after those four years or eight years, whatever we choose, we have more money in our pocket to do things. Now, if we chose maybe something like 30%, say we could get rid of 30% of the energy in our economy if we went across all these sectors, what would that mean in dollar value? We spend roughly 50 or $60 billion, let's say $50 billion a year on energy. If we get rid of 30% of that, that's $15 billion. $15 billion. 
not going to the utilities, but in our pockets and businesses' pockets. The mining tax was meant to raise how much? Three? Three billion? They got 126 million. If we invested in cost-effective energy efficiency reductions, the economy would be better off. Not certain sectors, coal, gas, etc. But the rest of the economy would be better off to the tune of, say, $15 billion. Much better, much cheaper to invest in energy efficiency than to invest in digging up coal, building coal-fired power stations, running coal-fired power stations, and transmitting electricity or other forms of energy, electricity in particular. All right. Now, you've got to have your heroes, haven't you, in life? Superheroes, maybe? Just ordinary heroes? This is one of my heroes, Art Rosenfeld. Oh, it takes me a while to get through this, so I better have a sip of water. This was a, a paper Art wrote uh, around about 1999-2000. Art Rosenfeld, sort of, one of the grandfather of um, energy efficiency, or one of them, started off as a nuclear physicist in um, Chicago, I think, working on, uh, on uh, heavy-duty uh, nuclear stuff uh, in Chicago, probably in the basketball courts, I think. Was, was that was that was the first nuclear pile? I think wasn't it down there somewhere? Yeah. So, um, but in the seventies, Art got intrigued by energy efficiency. The the he was working in California at the time, when when the oil crisis hit in the seventies, California was using oil for transport, oil for heating, and oil for electricity generation in in some places. So, triple whammy <laughs> for California. Art went to the California Energy Commissioner and said, hey, look, you know, we could, we could do better with end use efficiency. Let's apply the laws of physics, the laws of thermodynamics. Can we do better at end use efficiency? And he, he suggested that they start looking at refrigerators. Now, here's refrigerators, and it's, a, you know, it's hard for people to get excited about refrigerators, but I do get a little bit excited when I see a graph like this, and I'll tell you why. Starting back here, it's 1947, and there's a few people in the room that that can probably cast their minds back to somewhere near there, 1947, but not many, myself included. Uh, I, I came into the picture in, or more in the 60s, but anyway, here's 1947. Energy use of a refrigerator is around about 400. Average American refrigerator, 400 kilowatt hours per, per unit per annum, growing, growing, growing to the mid-70s. Here's the size of a refrigerator. Just divide these numbers by 100, you get eight cubic feet. That's the size of the refrigerator is growing. You'll notice that the energy usage was growing quicker than the size of the refrigerators. Refrigerators, look, we, we can only tolerate so, such a, a large appliance in our house. 20 cubic feet, you can convert that to cubic meters if you like. But uh, about a 20 cubic foot refrigerator is where we've flattened out since the uh, 70s and the 80s. The energy use, though, hit a peak of 1,800, 1,800 kilowatt hours per refrigerator every year, average. Oh, I see. I'm getting instructions from the cameraman. Shine over here, he says. Yeah, okay. Got it, thanks. So here's 1,800 kilowatt hours per unit in the mid-70s. The oil crisis hit. Art Rosenfeld says, why don't we make our refrigerators more efficient. He convinces the Californian legislators that that's what they should do. They introduced the world's first energy efficiency standard for refrigerators in 1978. The manufacturers, of course, were they happy? No. They were dragged kicking and screaming by science to make their products more efficient. They said, we'll go out of business. Now, look, most of the refrigerator manufacturers have survived. They're still in business but they gradually made products same size, same service, but with less energy. And on and on it went. Soon we had the 1980 California standard, 1987. Then it went national in America in the 1990s and probably came to Australia at some stage as well. And by 2000, refrigerators are back here at around about 400 kilowatt hours per annum in, in 2000, about the same as 1947, but a, two and a half times bigger. Still refrigerating everything that we need to refrigerate. Still much the same size as 1975, but over four times, four times less energy. Not 4%, not 40%, four times less energy. 
my kind of numbers. Same, same deal, lot less energy. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, Art points out, Art Rosenfeld points out, that meant 50 gigawatts of power stations, electricity power stations, did not need to be built. Not needed to be built over that period of time. Just by one energy efficiency measure to make refrigerators more efficient. What's the current size of, uh, what's the global capacity of PV, ladies and gentlemen? Cumulative? About 20? More, maybe 20 or 30 gigawatts installed? Art points out that yeah, the energy efficiency guys are doing okay. Getting rid of the need to build 50 gigawatts of power station in America alone. Multiply that then across the globe. Australia as well, Europe, etc., Japan. A reduction in the amount of power that we actually need to run just our refrigerators. Okay. And later on in California, it's an interesting story. Got even more colourful. Who's this guy? Schwarzenegger. Any, any Schwarzenegger fans in today? Yeah, there's a few. I won't do the voice. Rob's going to put me on tape and put on the web, but you know, I might offend some Schwarzenegger uh, um, uh, impersonators out there if I get it wrong. But you know, he realises that the debate is over. The science is in. Time to act on global warming now, and that energy efficiency is the best way to do it, most cost effective. So even I, if you told me 30 years ago that I'd be standing in front of a crowd of people telling you that Arnold Schwarzenegger will get it right on energy, <laughs> I would have been very surprised, very surprised. All right, so enough on energy efficiency for now. We may come back. PV. Well, who's seen this curve? People have probably seen this one. Um, Emmanuel Sachs, professor at uh, MIT, put this together. Nice curve. Uh, again, uh, this is showing the cost of the electricity on the vertical axis in dollars per kilowatt hour as a function of time or size of really the size of the industry. So as we look at the cumulative production in gigawatts, oh, here's the numbers that I really needed, wasn't it? So yeah, we're, we're around about 20 or 30, somewhere in here to by today. This is back a few years now. This is about 2010, I think this came out. But anyway, you get the idea. Back in 1978, uh, the oil crisis stimulated interest in terrestrial, not space use, but terrestrial photovoltaics. Quite expensive back then, $5, around about $5 a kilowatt hour. So people who were predicting that one day this stuff would be cheap, um, people, people who did make those predictions usually got laughed at by sensible uh, people in the power industry. But as the industry has grown, the prices come down, and there's some of the technological achievements in the PV sector that's brought those things about. And today, as the industry has grown, this is a learning curve, by the way. As things get bigger, you learn how to do things better and, and more cost effectively. Roughly today, those numbers are pretty right. We're at very close to grid parity. Notice that what we're close to is retail electricity. Doesn't matter too much how you generate it, but retail electricity, let's rough numbers, about 20 cents a kilowatt hour on a levelized costing basis. We're not yet there to wholesale. I had to dis I'm not sure if he's in here. A fourth year student came to me and said, um, I want to do a project on costing a big centralized generating PV plants. And I said, well, look, you know, that's not really my area. You know, if I could have shown him this graph, you know, maybe, maybe somewhere into the future, PV will be cost effective with wholesale electricity. But my argument is, once it's cost effective against wholesale, it's even more cost effective against retail. I, I kind of find that a compelling argument, happy to discuss it. But anyway, we are very close, if not cheaper, than retail electricity prices as we grow the industry. Now, I thought I'd just show you, and this is, uh, is anyone coming to my class at 3 o'clock? Just, just have a little nap. I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to talk to you about, I was putting this together for the class this afternoon, and I thought it's quite nice. So this is current tariffs, ladies and gentlemen, in Sydney coming from our um, the utility is Energy Australia. If you're a domestic customer, you're going to pay something like 26.8 cents, including tax, 26.8 cents per kilowatt hour. 
So a reasonable, perhaps a reasonable price, but 26.8 cents. So just compare that to the PV back on the previous slide. We're, we're, we're ballpark, we're, we're competing at retail prices. Oh, by the way, what's, what's wholesale electricity around about? Well, it depends on where you are in the world. Australia, we're very cheap. Three, four, five cents a kilowatt hour, depending on time and year, time through the year. So uh, I'd, I'd rather be offsetting retail electricity because it's much more cost effective to do that rather than trying to compete with uh, wholesale. Uh, let's have a look at a power smart home. If you're in a power smart home, by the way, if you hook up PV on your home, the utilities want to put you on time of use because you're causing problems, aren't you? If you, if you hook up a, an air conditioner, they say, please, go ahead. They don't put you on time of use tariffs, but if you're a troublemaker and wanting to install PV, they want to put you on time of use tariffs. Now, time of use tariffs is, is, is to encourage people away from using energy during peak times. Peak times are bad. It costs the utilities lots of money to generate on 2% of the year when it's really hot, 40 degrees, costs them a lot of money to generate and ship power into the city during those 2% of the times when we can hit 40 degrees in Sydney. But they will charge you every working day of the year from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. What do they want to charge you now? 52.547 cents a kilowatt hour during peak times every single day of the year and there's no feed-in tariff. That's another long and sad story but the interesting thing is I think the utilities have painted themselves into a corner where their product is becoming so cost unattractive that energy efficiency and renewables are looking a whole lot better. But anyway, that's a nice one isn't it? I like that one. Okay. Um, and if you're a business, well, they whack the residential customers more than the business. Depending on how much you use, the bigger the customer, the less you pay. So some scales there of some peak rates for businesses, 48.73, 33.9 during peak and going down, the bigger you get. Um, and there's just a little trend. That's the residential electricity tariffs, 1980 to 2010. 1990 is, the index is 100, so it's not, a, not absolute values here, just relative values. Sydney versus Melbourne, these are residential prices. Most of the time what happens, it, there's, it's not shown here, but these price increases in electricity pretty much followed consumer price index right up until about 2006, 2007. After that, if they'd followed the CPI, we would have got to that black dot. So if if prices had gone up with inflation, we would have had the black dot today. Instead, they did that big jump. Now, most of that, most of that is the problem that the utility has in meeting peak demand and is driving them to really try and get as much money out of their customers as possible so that they can build a bigger grid and keep selling us more electricity, but not black out during peak demand. $18 billion is what they plan to spend in New South Wales just on meeting peak, poles and wires, transformers. Question, Anita. Oh, by the way, happy to take questions. I thought time of use is good because you're generating during the peak demand. So only... You mean PVs generating during peak demand? Yeah, so... Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. I should, there is some good news. You're right, Anita, thanks for that. If you're a commercial building like University of New South Wales, our, our load looks like, I'll show you some loads. That's good. We generate during peak demand and offset peak demand. Residential, maybe not so good because if people aren't at home using power, you might be generating off your PV and selling it out to the grid. They'll give you zero or eight cents a kilowatt hour perhaps. But if you use any power and you're not generating enough to cover what you use at home, they'll whack you at 52 cents. Sorry, they will charge you at 52 cents a kilowatt hour. I gotta be careful, haven't I? Rob's got me all on tape. So you're not, you're not necessarily generating everything you're using, but you're yeah. offsetting? Yeah, well if you, as long as you use, if you've got PV on your roof and what you generate is less than what you use, you are way ahead. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. The, the utilities have really played into our hands because they are now a much more expensive option than energy efficiency and renewables, PV in particular, on your roof. But doesn't the standing charge undermine that? Don't they have that? Ah, the voice of Gerald from the back. Yes, the standing charges, yes. So, 
as, as we start to move away from using, if people move to using less energy, they're getting less money out of us from the rate, the, the dollars per kilowatt hour, they'll start to increase the standing charges. Will, will they push customers so far that they will say, well, you know, we'll, we, we, we can't see a business case for being connected, we'll go independent of the grid? I've heard people say that. But let's move on. Now here's the Tyree Energy Building and perhaps one day, perhaps not too far away, I ought to run a tour of the building because I guess quite a few people haven't seen all the energy features of this building. A few people have, but not many. So perhaps we'll do that another time. There's 150 kilowatts of PV on our roof, which is not bad. Thanks to Rob, he got up on another building and took a very nice picture of our, of our building there. To show you some numbers, um, I don't know if many people have seen this sort of thing. This is the University of New South Wales live uh, data telling the world, you can find this on the web. Um, there's, there's the uh, there's the web page. And you can see this is the TETB. This is our building. And you can see that this is last week's data. The dash line is temperature. Uh, here's last Monday, the 4th of March. Uh, the total curve that we see there is the building demand, the load. And we can see that the green stuff is the PV. So we're generating maybe 120 or so kilowatts at peak in the middle of the day, which is not too bad. We're using 500 kilowatts of electricity, and so the PV is doing exactly what Anita was saying. It's, it's offsetting. Sometimes during shoulder, in the mornings, it's the shoulder rates, and from 2 o'clock onwards, it's where we're dealing with peak rates there. So the university's starting to look very favourably. Well, I think they should be looking very favourably at putting PV on any surface that we can. Maybe not students, but... <laughs> What's the, the payback period? Well, look, we, with this, I would say it's um, cost effective. Zero, almost, yeah, almost, almost immediately. Well, look, no, sorry, it will take itself a little while to pay, pay back that capital cost. It's always an, an interesting thing for us in renewables, but it's a cost effective deal. What's the payback period on a coal fired power station? They take out loans over 30 years to pay off the, the building of that and just charge money. So it's the same deal. We're, we're now cost effective. The levelized cost of electricity out of PV on a big building like this, cost effective. Almost, the university pays a little less. I can't say how much they pay. They won't tell me because they know I'd tell. <laughs> it's, it's confidential. Um, but uh, yeah, we're close. We're close. As PV prices come down more, we get better. Okay, now that's the TETB. That's not the whole story of the TETB because we import cooling energy from the law building. Um, we've, there's big pipes underneath the ground. But what I better talk about now, this is the total university picture. This is, this is actually, I tried to get the um, hot day from uh, early in January, January, Tuesday the 8th. It's a bit hard to see there. We had a 40 degree day. You can see the temperature there over on the right hand graph uh, axis is the 40 degree day. Uh, you can see that the total university demand is 12 megawatts, something like that. It can go higher than that, particularly during O-Week. Lots of student activities, lots of energy getting used. The interesting one for me is the six megawatts, six megawatts of use in the middle of the night when nobody's here. Could we be more efficient? I think so. Interesting to see. Uh, and by the way, that green now is a lot of trigen, cogen, trigen being generated. The solar is hard to see uh, in comparison to the amount coming from cogen, trigen. Okay, look, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about wind energy. Now, and you might have seen these sorts of things, very similar sorts of curves. This is Germany. Uh, the yellow stuff on top, these are load curves. They're getting quite a sizable chunk of their energy now coming from solar, the yellow, and the paler colour underneath, which I hesitate to give a name to, uh, is wind. And so they're, they're really uh, making sizable dent in their energy demand. Well, they're supplying a lot from solar and wind. Now, can we integrate that into buildings? Well, um, perhaps. These are some uh, interesting sort of mixmaster types ones. If anyone been to Melbourne recently, the Australian Catholic University building, I've got the model of it here. Yeah, it's got about six of these things on the roof uh, twirling away. They look quite spectacular.
takes me back to my childhood, uh, you know, watching Mixmaster Blades, maybe. But um, I, I'm not, I'm not too sure how the architects would respond. What do you think, architects? Is that, is that, a, is that a thing of beauty? In my eyes, I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> but uh, maybe the architects, maybe not so enthusiastic. Look, there's other options out there. There's uh, wind pods. Can we do building integrated um, wind? Maybe. Uh, again, maybe there's a question of aesthetics. There's some residential, commercial, and a, and a bridge with these uh, basically cylindrical wind turbines that can run horizontally so they don't have to be sticking up off the roof. Anyway, time will see whether that's a, a sensible option. Intriguing to see that because wind, unlike PV, can help us at times when uh, the sun's not shining, of course. So. We don't, we don't always get power out of our PV as we know, but when it's windy, we can get more power to help cover more of the load. So it might be interesting to look, keep an eye out for uh, building integrated wind. All right, um, I won't spend too much time talking about batteries. Perhaps at some stage we should get someone from chemical engineering to come and talk about batteries, but a quick, quick comment from me. What's the price of the grid electricity doing? It's going up, up, up. Price of PV? and other renewables going down, as, the, as that gap widens, the opportunity to invest in storage becomes more and more possible. <coughs> storage as a central generator, tough. You've got to generate at four cents, a kilowatt hour, four cents a kilowatt hour to compete, and then you've got to pay for storage. So I would argue storage, distributed storage, is where we should be thinking. Low carbon design and integration, let's move on. Look, this is uh, Bly Street, a very nice six star office building. Oh, by the way, TTB, this building is six star. There's four six star educational buildings and I showed you the other one down in um, Melbourne, the Australian Catholic University. In the ci city of Sydney, this is probably the latest addition to the most energy efficient buildings that we have around the place. And it's got some really nice features. Uh, nice integrated design. I'll talk more about integrated design in a minute because I realise I'm running rapidly out of time. Uh, but you can see on the top here, and for all you photovoltaic enthusiasts, I'm sorry to say it, this is not photovoltaic uh, on the top here. Some people might argue that it should be, but in fact that's, photo that's thermal, solar thermal. And it's not just an architectural um, feature that it, they're all around here looking like the, uh, something off a, f a plant or a flower or something. They're in fact trying to, level out the, um, trying to level out the output from the solar thermal array. So they've got some, some of the panels over here are facing the afternoon sun, some are facing the uh, morning sun, and the rest of them are sort of towards the midday sun. So this is solar thermal array that's powering an absorption chiller. There's also natural gas boosted uh, backup on that. And so quite a nice building, six star, green star, the, the latest in, in, in Sydney. I won't, don't have time to go into what a, th a thermally driven cycle looks like, but a lot of people in the, uh, uh, in the world of HVAC would love to have a thermally driven cycle driven by solar energy. The mechanical engineers on this campus and all over the world are doing just that, working on these sorts of approaches. For me, well, it's interesting to see as photovoltaics come down, as the price of heat pumps come down, who knows who will be the ultimate winner, but interesting to, to investigate these sorts of different systems. Or we can put more PV in interesting places, vertical surfaces. University of New South Wales Library, I think, would look quite nice with a lot of vertical PV on it. Um, this is just some numbers, kilowatt hours per metre squared, just to give you an idea. This is um, comparing typical buildings to the 60L design. That's a, an older but greener, green building down in Melbourne. I just wanted to point something out here. You'll see that the typical commercial design in Australia, and for Melbourne in particular, the, the typical commercial designs need quite a lot of cooling energy. If you approach it from an energy efficiency perspective, and 60L design down in Melbourne did quite well, they turned that around. Instead of having more energy required for cooling than heating, which is true for a Melbourne climate. Anyone been to Melbourne in the winter? Yeah. It's pretty cool down there. Um, average temperatures in Melbourne average about six, seven degrees. 
average temperature in Sydney in the winter, 18 degrees maximum daytime, 8 degrees overnight, average about 13. Melbourne's another 5 or so degrees cooler. Their summers are similar to us. They do have some very peaky 40 degree days, but on the whole, the climate says that a, a commercial building in Melbourne should need more heating than cooling. Poorly designed buildings need more cooling than heating. 60L got it right when they design it properly, not to capture summer sun. Do daylighting, get rid of the lighting load. Look at your internal equipment loads and they got about a 70% reduction. Pretty well cost effective straight away. If you're smart, you can do it. We've got to learn how to do it. This is just something I show my students. Shading of windows. I'd like to shade windows. Keep that sun out between March. We're almost at March 21st. Between the equinoxes in Sydney, uh, so from really from September through to March, I'd like to shade the windows. And if you're facing north, you can do that with a fixed shade, a fixed overhang. And probably now, the most cost-effective thing to put as a shading device would probably be a PV panel because they're getting so cheap. Couldn't say that a few years ago, could I? <laughs> anyway, here we go. Let's shade that window. There's March. Let the sun in from May, June. Shut it down by September 21st. Really shaded in December. Thought I'd show you this one. This is the northern window on the roof of this building. Uh, yesterday, 10.15 a.m. Uh, looking out the window, you can see that's onto the rooftop. When you don't shade, build, when you don't shade windows properly, that's what happens. There's, um, well, it's probably 40, there's an infrared image there at the front that you can see. 46 degrees or so is the maximum that it's recording. The little dot is on the 43 degrees. That's inside the building. The sun's getting in, heating up the building. The rest of the room is sitting at around about 24, 25 degrees, uh, but we have a little bit of a, a heat problem uh, because we haven't quite shaded that window enough. And I'd like to put up a few solar panels to help do the shading there. And it's probably, as I said before, 250 bucks a square meter installed. So why not? Put it on the rooftops, distributed, what a good idea. Integrated into nice buildings, what a good idea. Architecturally good, generate power, some daylighting. Got to be careful with that in Australia. Boy, we've got to be careful. Uh, as, as visitors to, to our shores know, uh, the sun's a little more intense here than it is in other parts of the world, perhaps. And uh, we don't want to let too much daylighting in. We've got to be careful with that. One of my favourite sorts of technologies that's maybe not had much uh, airplay in recent times or not been at the top of the hits, Hit Parade. Um, Got to keep going on my time. PVT, can we take heat from the PV and make use of that heat? There are possibilities there. Heating buildings is good, so places like Canada, you'll see examples of that sort of thing happening there. We can cool the PV a little get more power out of them, particularly if they're crystalline silicon. But anyway, some interesting technologies there. Uh, look, I don't have time to talk about halogens and the, the fact that they only convert 6% of their energy into uh, light and the rest is heat. Bit of a nightmare. If you see a halogen, you probably should uh, be very careful. They're dangerous things. Uh, but anyway, better move on. Amory Lovins, great little article. Anything by Amory, track it down. He says we can not only protect the Earth's climate, it will make businesses and consumers richer. I believe that. Sometimes people criticise Amory because he doesn't give the details, but just take a little bit of time, dig into it, look at those IEA or the NFEE numbers that I showed you. Energy efficiency is very cost effective and it's good for businesses, it's good for consumers. Some nice lectures of Amory's on buildings if you get a chance to track them down. These slides will be up on the web so you can look that up. And he's got some interesting buildings that he's worked on over the years. His own house is up in the uh, the Rocky Mountains, and I think he grows bananas up there in very cold temperatures. Uh, so, and he's always been an advocate for smart design, that if you design things well up front, you can get multiple benefits out of all of the things that you're doing. It need not cost you more, but you can dramatically reduce the energy that you need. He talks about overcoming uh, the, the barrier, which is usually cost. If we try and make small savings, 
what we do is if we start from a business as usual scenario and we try and make little savings, what we find is that very quickly we get diminishing savings and eventually we reach a cost effective limit and we say, well, stop here. We should stop here. What he argues though is that when we go further, if we look for, instead of looking for incremental savings, if we look for big savings in energy, not only do we get those big energy savings over time that's going to help, we also save on the cost of the mechanical services that we need. HVAC, electrical services, all of these things can be saved. So there's upfront capital cost savings in smart green buildings, which we need to understand and learn how to do better. Amory's been doing it for years, but the rest of us need to catch up. And then he says, well, big energy savings can actually mean that it's not more costly to build, but may in fact either be cheaper or much the same cost. So he talks about tunneling through that barrier to more efficient buildings. NREL, you can look up this webinar uh, and the PDF that's associated. There's their zero energy building. Their integrated design approach, they compared. Here's the conventional building and here's the building costs. A big chunk on mechanical, a big chunk on the architecture, the design, big chunk on electrical systems, big chunk on structural. Now what they say from an operational point of view is the architects will like this, spend more money on the design. But it's got to be integrated design. You need the HVAC designers, you need the electrical designers, you need the building envelope designers to talk to each other. Strange as that may seem. You need, we need the designers of a green building to talk to each other in an integrated way, learn how to do things in smart ways, shrink the requirement for mechanical, shrink, so more efficient envelope, less internal heat loads, spend more time on the design, more money on the design, you have a smaller HVAC system. Better daylighting systems, smaller electrical load, smaller electrical systems needed. Cost, much the same. Spend more on the design, less on the capital. Pumps, don't have time to go into pumps, but just a quick one. Has anyone ever seen pumping layouts that look like this in plant rooms? Have you ever seen this tangled mess of spaghetti? Have you seen that? That's wrong. I had a student look at the law building over here. It's a tangled mess of spaghetti, very similar to this. He redesigned the piping network and got rid of 60% of the friction, 60% of the friction. 60% of the energy. Friction is energy. Amory Lovins points out a study was done, they did this in reality. They shrunk a supposedly optimised designed pumping loop from 70 kilowatts down to 5. 92% saving. Let cost less to build. The plumbers are upset, the pipe installers are upset. They love spending lots of time and money on your installations, giving you lots of bends and stuff, because you've laid out the equipment first and then said, oh, I've got to get a pipe from here to there, but you've got to go over that other pipe and around that other pipe and in underneath. Wrong way around. Think very carefully, design it carefully, lay out the equipment so that the pipe runs are short, put big diameter pipes, and then you can save lots of energy. There are two or three 150 kilowatt pumps that run 24 hours a day over in the law building. And there's a couple of 500 kilowatt pumps. Now I think they could be shrunk. Maybe not 60%, maybe more, who knows. But if I get rid of 60, 70, 80% of the energy required for those pumps, that's a lot of energy. It makes the 150 kilowatts of PV on the rooftop do a whole lot more if we have less demand. How am I going for time, Rob? I'm r rapidly running out, I sense, aren't I? Yeah, okay. I might skip over a few things. These things will be in the, uh, the slides, but you know, we did a study looking at how much time it takes to pay back investments in energy efficiency and renewables. This is a few years ago. It saves you money. The energy you save on a loan on, on your house. We, we're used to the idea of borrowing money for our homes and paying it off over 25 years. Borrow some money and invest in energy efficiency and renewables. Use the energy savings to pay off your loan. Um, insulate your houses better is a good idea. But PVT, I'll have to spend another time, I think, talking about that. I better move on. 
and I better not talk about transport, but electric vehicles are coming and watch out, is all I can say. Maybe some bioenergy. Oh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about termites. I pinched this from Amory. Hey, um, termites, they don't, they don't usually get good press. If they do, I've missed it. But termites, they, don't have, they, they live in very low carbon built environments, ladies and gentlemen. These are termite mounds up in Northern Territory. Anyone been to Northern Territory, seen these things? They're quite spectacular. Uh, they're, they're probably twice the size of a human being in height. So they live in high rise. Um, they have solar driven ventilation. They have air earth heat exchange. They've got indoor climate control. Um, plus or minus one degree at 31 degrees, which is just ideal for, for what they need to be able to do. A bit warm for humans, but just right for termites. Northern Territory, three degrees in the winter overnight, 42 degrees in the daytime, at least in, in the summer. But they can maintain 31 degrees plus or minus one. We can't. We don't know how to do that. Not without digging up lots of coal or oil or natural gas. Have we got something to learn from the termites? Have we got something to learn from Mother Nature? Yes. I'll tell you a little bit about the CRC for low carbon living and then I guess I better let you go to class. Three areas of activities, technical sort of stuff, integrated building systems, solar, low carbon, integrated design, going up to the planning level. How do we take what we know for, about buildings and build cities that are low carbon? So we need to know about that. By the way, when you build low carbon buildings in low carbon cities, one of the big benefits, apart from getting rid of the CO2 and energy savings, is health and productivity. This university probably spends, well, now a commercial building spends about three, five percent on energy, the rest on people. You make people happier, healthier, more productive. That's good for the bottom line. And we need to engage with behavioural changes in our communities. This message needs to get out there and people need to understand it and be a part of it. Doing it for real, demonstrating it, that's what we're on about. Building buildings, building communities, testing, getting people to give us feedback, the behavioural issues, the technical issues. Let's trial it, let's show that it works. And, well, I think I better stop. Thanks very much. for that wonderful talk. We have time for a couple of questions. So, um, anybody has questions? Jono. Uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, you showed um, a lot of nice pictures and talked a bit about, uh, sort of, I guess, the high-end stuff, the new you know, six-star buildings and so on. But I'm thinking that's probably um, a, a small segment of the, of the total market. So, you, yeah, so new buildings are a small segment of the total market, and you're absolutely right. 2% of buildings will be new, 98% are old. So, yeah, we need to retrofit. Yeah. We need to tackle retrofits. And uh, sadly, in Australia, we had a go at that with the insulation scheme, and so it's probably uh, a touchy issue. But, look, I think that um, we're, we're, we're starting to move in that direction, and the CRC is very much aware that that is something that we need to be tackling. So lessons we learn from new buildings... We need to be thinking very carefully, how can we apply this to retrofits? And you're absolutely right. But also not just retrofits, <coughs> yeah. we're talking about, um, and, you know, I remember a, a, a clever shoot of yours many years ago, you did a, an undergrad thesis on, um, on green buildings in the, in the kit home market, and mansions and so on. Yeah, still 2% in those. Is, is that stuff taken off now? Is, is that, is that, are those companies actually offering um, green options these days? So are green buildings taking off in the mass market for homes? Look, it's starting to filter in. What's good is the Building Code of Australia had, has now got something to say about energy. Before 2006, the Building Code of Australia had precisely zero to say about energy, which is a bit of a shame. So you could build anything you want. It could leak heat. It could leak air. Real, real problem. 2006, we are now ramping up the energy requirements in the Building Code. So that's impacting new buildings and mass buildings as well. Interestingly, we had some visitors from Canada. The building code in Canada, I was amazed. They have marginally more need for, sorry, their building code is marginally better than ours in terms of insulation required. I was amazed. I was amazed. But anyway, that's a story for another time. Thanks for the question. We have time for one more question. 
Elsa, um, residential energy efficiency, um, having a house that the bank owns. Am I consulting now? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, to me it's not the uh, energy company or, or uh, retailer that's actually stopping me or deterring me from energy efficiency. Mm. It's kind of myself. Yes. Or, or have I been tricked by this? No, that's right. So that's that's a that's a barrier is the homeowner. There's not a great deal of incentive for the homeowner to improve their energy efficiency, except until the last few years, perhaps as as um, energy prices go sky high. We had someone come to us and ask us to help them. They had a f typical energy bill is one and a half, two thousand dollars, depending on how you use energy. Someone came to us with a five thousand dollar a year energy bill. So when we're seeing fourteen percent increases over the last year, few years, every year, uh, people are wanting to save energy. Um, so yeah, he, he replaced this guy, we, we gave him a long list of things he could do. He did replace 110 halogen downlights in his home with LEDs. And he saw a 10% reduction in his, in his usage and leveled out his bills. So he, he, he reduced his energy by about 10% and the bills went up by about the same amount in terms of cost per kilowatt hour. So he leveled it out. So, I think cost is the driver for people, but you're right, I mean, he was still tough. He, he didn't want to adopt anything. We suggested that he might get his kids to close the doors when the air conditioning's on and the heating's on. He said that was too tough. <laughs> I can understand that. You gotta get them young. Well, sorry that we don't have more time for questions, but uh, let's thank uh, Alistair again for this great talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.